Hello everyone and welcome back. Reviews go up today for the AMD Ryzen 7 7800X 3D. Yet another fastest CPU for gaming and I'm celebrating today's launch with a slightly different video than usual. And I have four main things that are gonna be happening in today's video, so let me run down them for you. First, we have some benchmarks on the 7800X 3D, some light benchmarks and we're focusing on gaming. Second, we are doing a build with the parts you see here. The build is sponsored by Thermaltake. In fact, this entire video is sponsored by Thermaltake, so a big thank you to them. Thirdly, we have a giveaway, because why build a system around the 7800X 3D with an RTX 4070Ti, unless I'm gonna give it away too, and that giveaway is already up and linked in the video's description. And fourth, the reason I'm doing the giveaway is to support a very good cause, and that is a fundraiser for my good friend Travis. So before we cover some benchmark results and get into the build, I wanted to quickly bring you guys up to speed on the situation with my friend, Travis Peacock. From 2018 through last year, Travis' passion project was Shellback Tech, a charity organization that he ran with a very cool goal, to build gaming PCs, custom gaming PCs for disabled veterans and first responders. And he was really good at it. He built more than 55 custom PCs, like the ones you're looking at right now, that were distributed through the charity. Unfortunately though, Travis has had an extremely challenging year since last summer, both on the home front and due to personal health issues. So he has been forced to shut down Shellback Tech, which I know was absolutely devastating for him. But of course, family and health should always come first. Those same health problems have left Travis and his family in a precarious financial position. And on top of everything else, in December 2022, Travis was diagnosed with the autoimmune disease seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, presenting with rheumatoid nodules in both joints of the legs and the arms. And that has resulted in severe muscle wasting as well as causing pain when Travis tries to do simple things like walk or use his hands. Travis is a disabled US Navy veteran himself and in the time I've known him has been a model of kindness, compassion, and generosity on top of being a top-notch PC builder. So it only seemed natural to me that after everything Travis has done for others, perhaps we, together with the help of Thermaltake and the sponsored build giveaway, could give a little bit back to him. So check the video's description down below for a link to enter the giveaway. To enter the giveaway, all you have to do is visit the GoFundMe page, which also has a lot more information on Travis and his current situation. And you do not have to donate to the GoFundMe to enter the giveaway, but if you can, it will be greatly appreciated. Thank you all for your generosity, and all proceeds will go to help Travis and his family. Next up, let's check out some benchmarks since this is the review embargo date for the 7800X 3D, which alongside its siblings, 7950X 3D and the 7900X 3D are focused on gaming. So that's what I'm focusing on today with a handful of games. Now in order to compare my benchmark results with the tests that I ran last month on the 7950X 3D, I'm using largely the same hardware for these test result numbers that I'm showing you right now. Apart from the motherboard, which I've changed out to the X670E Aorus Master, which is the motherboard I'm using for the build, today, which is also kind of required because AMD wanted reviewers to do a fresh install of Windows for testing. You couldn't use the same installation that you used for testing the 7950X 3D, which is kind of a pain in the butt. But as you can see here, apart from the X670E Aorus Master motherboard that we're using, we're using the same DDR5 6000 memory kit, the same CPU cooler, the same power supply, and yes, the same graphics card, which is the RTX 4090, Founders Edition model directly from NVIDIA. The 7800X 3D has already been revealed. We already know the stats and the price at $450. Here's a quick comparison between those and the CPUs that were tested today if you're interested. And the first thing that I found quite interesting was actually the power draw for the 7800X 3D. That resulted in a peak system power usage during gaming of 560 watts, which is only surpassed in terms of efficiency in that metric by the 5800X 3D. The peak frequency I saw during testing was 5.05 gigahertz. And also thanks to that low power draw we had, a fairly low maximum temperature of 80.4 degrees Celsius. Now granted, this is with a 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler, but compared to the 7950X that gets up to 95 degrees, the 13900K that can get up to 100. And also noting that this CPU only broke 80 degrees Celsius in one test, and with most of the other gaming tests, it was hovering around 70 degrees Celsius. It is good news that you don't necessarily need the highest end all-in-one liquid coolers to keep this CPU cool. That said, we are using a pretty high end all-in-one liquid cooler today. And now let's run through some quick benchmarks. First off, we have Cinebench R23. This is just testing the CPU. And in the multi-thread test, the 7800X 3D got 18,236 points on average, which is a decent improvement over the previous generation 5800X 3D, which is also the only other eight core 16 thread CPU on this chart. But you can see why the 7950X and 13900K do cost more for some people who are gonna use it for the compute tasks. That is because they have lots more cores and threads, so much higher scores there. 
and the single thread test, the 7800X3D hit 1,823 points. Again, an improvement over the 5800X3D, but staying a bit behind the 7950X and 7950X3D. And this is primarily due to the higher frequency that those 16 core models run at, and the 13900K does still dominate in this test with a score of over 2200. But single thread Cinebench scores do not always translate into peak gaming performance, as we can see here with our Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark running at 4K 3840 by 2160. And here, all of our CPUs are within uh, two or three frames of each other with the 7800X 3D just narrowly edging out the competition. I've run all my gaming benchmarks today at 1080 and 4K. 4K is a more practical resolution for someone who's actually running an RTX 4090 and a CPU like the 7800X 3D. But at 1080, the results will be a little bit more CPU bound, so it might show a little bit more variance between the different CPUs and therefore which CPU is a better CPU for gaming, at least at a more fundamental level. And here the 7800X 3D has a very excellent performance, 334.2 frames per second on average, places it pretty decently beyond the rest of the pack. The closest competitor is the 7950X 3D with 306.8 frames per second on average, and that improved performance is reflected in the 1% low results as well. Next up we have Cyberpunk 2077, which is a DirectX 12 based game, and here at 4K we have grouped up numbers between all the CPUs, with the 7950X actually winning, and the 7950X 3D and 7800 X 3D close behind, just a couple frames. But again, if we switch over to 1920 by 1080, a more CPU bound situation, the 7800X 3D is able to stretch its legs a little bit or take advantage of that 3D V cache a little bit more, or apparently to leverage the fact that it only has one CCD, so there is no latency in communication between the two CCDs like you have with the 7950X 3D. And again, the 7800X 3D did quite well, scoring 213.6 average frames per second. Next up, we have Resident Evil Village at 4K, again, a DirectX 12 game. And here at 4K, the numbers are all similar around 230 frames per second. So again, this just goes to show that if you're gaming at 4K, you have lots of choices in CPUs and you can go with a more budget one and still have good gaming performance, or you can go with the higher end one if you're actually going to take advantage of all those cores and threads for something else other than gaming. Switching over to 1920 by 1080, and once again, the 7800X 3D is coming out on top with 458 average frames per second. A good 25 FPS better than the 7950X 3D, which is telling me maybe this is why AMD launched the 7950X 3D a month before the 7800X 3D. Because again, for a lot of gamers who don't need those cores and threads, a price of 450 bucks is a little bit better than 700. Of course, I couldn't go through some benchmarks without including Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, which is a notoriously CPU bound game, and also one that uh, you guys apparently really like when I test. Here, even at 4K, the 7800X 3D has a strong showing of 93.6 average frames per second. Again, beating out the 7950X 3D, the previous champ in this game, at 88.6 frames per second. And again, switching over to 1080, the 7800X 3D maintains a lead, 115.4 average frames per second. But at either resolution here, it's a good indication that if you're building a system specifically for flight simulator, you probably want to go with one of these X3D CPUs or an Intel solution if that makes more sense to you. Rounding things out with Doom Eternal because I wanted to throw a Vulcan game into the mix as well. And at 4K, the 7800X 3D hit 368.8 frames per second on average. And this was a game where the 7950X 3D was able to do marginally better hitting 380 average FPS. All the CPUs here are again within the same ballpark, about 15 to 20 frames per second of each other. And if we switch over to 1920 by 1080, we see a similar variance between them with the 7800X 3D coming out on top though, and actually achieving a win not only over the 7950X 3D, but also over the 13900K, which was the previous champ in this category. 697.1 beats it out for the average frame rate, and 422.7 is the best in terms of 1% lows, except for the 7950X. So that concludes my modest set of benchmarks today for the 7800X 3D. And my mini review summary right now is that uh, it's another really good CPU for gaming, perhaps even the best CPU for gaming as of now, although those benchmark results will vary depending on the title and the resolution that you're playing at. For pure gaming performance and anyone who is considering a 7950X 3D or like a 13900K, this makes much more sense because it is less expensive. But likewise, if you are trying to stick to a budget and get bang for your buck, the 5800X 3D is still an excellent performer. It's still on the AM4 platform, which is less expensive to invest in. And while you don't have an upgrade path with the 5800X 3D, you can buy it for around $300 to $350, which is about 100 plus less dollars than the 7800X 3D. 
But since lots of reviews are going up today, I will gather a handful that I think are well done and post links to those in the description as well. So if you're trying to make a buying decision today, you can get a second, third, fourth, and fifth opinion. So there it is. We have covered the mini review. We've covered the giveaway and the GoFundMe for Travis. Now we just need to assemble this system. Let's take a closer look at the parts. So if you've been looking at this lovely assortment of parts that I have, you might have been thinking to yourself, I think there might be one or two parts that are missing. And you'd be right. I just ran out of room. So uh, quickly, let me point out that we are going to be using a thermal take tough liquid ultra all-in-one liquid cooler today and those happen to come in a variety of different flavors shapes and sizes we have the tough liquid ultra 420 here which has three 140 millimeter fans which also means it has a 420 millimeter radiator which some cases support in fact the series 500 case that we're building in today does support a 420 millimeter aio in the front but thermal take sent the tough liquid ultra 360 as well and since i've already shown that the 7800 x 3d can get by with not necessarily the top peak highest end cooler out there. And because of how I think some of the stuff is gonna get laid out in the case, I'm gonna go with the 360 for today, which means we can trade out the 424. Our graphics card, the GPU that we're building with today, and also the one that's gonna be uh, in the giveaway system. The Zotac Gaming Amp Aero version of the GeForce RTX 4070 Ti. I have complimented Zotac's Amp Aero design on the graphics card quite a few times, actually, so it is high time that I actually include this in a build, and a build that's uh, also a giveaway. What could be a better solution than that? For our power supply, we will have plenty of headroom since we have a Thermaltake Tough TuffPower GF3 1000 watt fully modular 80 plus gold rated power supply. And hey, look, a nice convenient feature about this one, since we are using an RTX 40 series graphics card, we have a PCI Gen 5 ready 16 pin connector. ATX 3.0 compatible, nice. It's the future. Just make sure it's plugged in all the way. Continuing the veritable assault of Thermaltake products that we have today is a DDR5 memory kit, 5,600 mega transfers per second and a 32 gig kit, two by 16 gigs. This is Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG RGB D5 with 16 addressable LEDs and compatibility with a wide range of RGB control software, including of course, Thermaltake's own RGB control software. Here's a cool little add-on for our case and airflow and helping us make sure we populate all those potential areas where we can place fans. We have Thermaltake's SWA fans, the SWA fan EX12 RGB right here. This pack includes three fans, one controller, and three sets of extra fan blades because the SWA in SWA fan stands for swap or swappable. You can swap in a different set of fan blades, which means it will reverse the airflow. So if you're not PC builders who want to have your fans in a particular orientation, but who really don't like the way that the backs of the fans look, what with their support bracket that they have to have across there to hold the center assembly and everything. So Thermaltake came up with the swap fans with the extra fans that you can swap in so you can have all your fans facing the same direction for a nice uniform look. We have a couple components here that have actually already been installed because like I said, I set this system up for and benchmarking and those numbers that I already went over. Our motherboard is from Gigabyte. It's the Oris X670E Oris Master socket AM5 motherboard with all the trimmings and bells and whistles. This motherboard looks quite nice. It also has some really cool features like the uh, little button that you push to eject your graphics card, especially if you're running benchmarks or you can't access your graphics card little catch after you plug it in. That's a really handy feature. This motherboard also weighs like half a ton. It's like a brick of copper in your hand. It's really nice though. We gotta have some storage. So for that, we have the Crucial P3 Plus, PCIe 4.0, NVMe M.2 SSD. This goes up to 5,000 megabytes per second reads and it's a two terabyte drive. So plenty of room for both the operating system as well as a tidy amount of Steam games. And lastly, we have our case, the Series 500. I know it's C-E-R-E-S, but Thermaltake assures me that that is pronounced Series. And I first looked at this case at CES. They had several different builds there and I was quite impressed with it. For one, it's got good airflow, plenty of perforations there at the front. Airflow is one of those basic functions that a case should have, so I like that Thermaltake has gone with the high airflow design. It's also got a fairly unique look, I'd say, in terms of the layout of the grid for the airflow, wherever there are perforated panels for the air to flow through. And as we saw in a couple of the builds that they had at CES, not only is this the ARGB fan version that comes with four ARGB fans included, but Thermaltake has also added this LCD panel kit, which can uh, be added to this little section of the case right there, where there's just a blank panel otherwise a 3.9 inch LCD monitor that supports the Thermaltake RGB Plus 2.0 software, specifically designed for this case and will give you a nice heads up look at some system information, or there's a bunch of other stuff you can do with it too. So there's a rundown of the parts we're building with today fairly high-end PC that we're assembling. And a big thank you again to Thermaltake for sponsoring this build and allowing me to give it away for a lucky fan out there. Let's put it together and see how it looks.
Okay, let's check in with a closer look at this case, the Series 500 case from Thermaltake. I've removed the side panels. We got a tempered glass side panel on this side with one of the biggest, fattest thumb screws that I've ever seen on a computer right there, but that's because it's actually this kind of latch. You know, you just turn it this way to close and turn it this way to, to open it back up. And then on this side, you have a couple slide off hinges so you can pull the entire side panel off. And we're gonna wait to peel the uh, protective plastic off of that until the system is all built. Opposite side panel over here, pretty standard. You do have a removable dust filter right there and three captive thumb screws to pull that off. And then we can get a better look at the case itself. Again, like I said, just plenty of ventilation up here. And that is uh, really a feature that I like to see on newer cases, especially. And it sort of continues that pattern across the top and the front to give you sort of a unified design throughout. Even over here on this side panel, which is also removable with thumb screws, by the Way. This is a pretty modular case, but that also has a dust filter on it. So it does seem like Thermaltake has done a pretty good job making sure that wherever you might have intakes on this case, you have dust filtration as well. This panel right here is the one we'll be removing to add that LCD panel kit. And then I, I couldn't figure out at first what this was here that's twist tied to the bottom of the case when it first arrives. So then here is a fairly long metal piece, and this is actually a GPU support bracket. So this piece is gonna sit in the channel like there-ish. That would allow you to slide that up or down depending on where your GPU actually is. You may be able to see, but some of these are actually threaded down here. They're not just holes that pass through. So that gives you various places to mount this, again, depending on the length of your graphics card and where you want that metal support to be. And then it would live right there in your build, going completely vertically from the bottom of the case to the top. So let me know in the comments section, what do you guys think of this GPU mount? Is it, is it good? Is it bad? Is it okay? Beyond this, they have also included a riser bracket for a vertically mounted GPU. And like many thermal take cases, you can actually remove all of your PCIe slots, your expansion slots there and rotate it 90 degrees so it will line up with that bracket. Just do note that the riser cable that you would need to actually connect your graphics card down there is sold separately, but Thermaltake has a lot of those solutions available as well. The ARGB version of this case comes with four fans pre-installed. They're 140 millimeter RGB enabled fans, hence the RGB in the name. And we've got the IO right here on the side as well as the power button that does have a USB type C 3.2 Gen 2 port, a couple USB 3.0s, mic, headphone, and reset button. The manual also shows how to remove this front piece, which is, I believe, why they put these little grips right here on the side. You're supposed to, oh, yeah, actually wasn't too bad at all. It just has some pegs right there with some catches, so that pulls off fairly easily as well. More dust filtration right there. Oh, I should say, removable dust filtration, which is great for helping you clean it. That is held in with magnets, and then that gives you access to the front of the case and the front fans. Oh, and this would also show you how you would mount a 420 millimeter fan radiator combo with the 340 millimeter fans right there, and then there's a cutout down here so you could fit a very large radiator in this case, which is not a very large case. Checking back in as the build progresses and we have uh, just a couple more steps left. I still need to install the power supply down in the basement. Although I have already been pre-wiring up some of the modular cables. So one question I had about this build was uh, for the motherboard, uh, which is a very nice motherboard, but it is EATX. And part of the reason I chose this motherboard is because it was on a short list of four motherboards that had BIOS support for the 7800X3D prior to launch. So that is one of the key reasons why I chose it. But since it's EATX, it does stick out just a little bit and partially covered 
cover some of these grommeted pass-through uh, zones that they have over here for cables. Fortunately, with these flat ribbon style cables, there is still uh, enough room to pass it through, but I did do that before I mounted the motherboard, so that is something to keep in mind for anyone who's attempting to install an EATX board in this case. There's a bit more room up top for passing through stuff, so like the uh, eight pin connectors up there weren't an issue. And fortunately, we also have enough USB 2.0 headers on this board. We have two of them for USB 2.0 devices because we have three to connect. We have the LCD panel right here. Uh, we have one connector for the uh, AIO pump and RGB connector there. And we have this uh, little breakout control box, which is what came with the SWA fan kit. And I decided to install the SWA fans on the top. And that is pretty much an aesthetic consideration. The fans that, that uh, come with uh, the Thermaltake AIOs are actually quite nice and capable, but they don't have RGB and I wanted to use the SWA fans. So that's where they went. We are not taking advantage of the SWA fans swappable fan feature. They are pointing in the uh, standard orientation. They do have a standard orientation here in terms of airflow, but we did take advantage of the fact that these are also daisy chainable with the magnets. They just snap together. So that makes connecting all of them up pretty easy. And then just one snap on connector there to feed back to connect up to our little hub here. But hey, small detail for Thermaltake that I thought was nice. Uh, these USB 2.0 connectors that they include all come split to be two way connectors with two of these little USB plugs on each end. And I'm very glad of that because like I said, we needed three. We only have two of these plugs, but that would allow us to connect up to four devices. So we actually still have one USB plug available. But we are moving on to the last phase of this build, which is gonna involve wiring up our fans, of course. We're gonna connect them up to this controller. One note here is that the controller has dip switches on the back and you can reference uh, the included manual. This is just to tell it how many devices are connected. We have three devices connected, so I believe that's the orientation we want the dip switches to be in. Looks about right to me. So we just have some cable management to handle, plugging in those fans, getting the power supply installed down in the bottom, and lastly, installing the graphics card. And now after a bit of hard work and uh, elbow grease, I think they used to call it, uh, the system is complete. It's assembled. I'm fairly certain that it will boot up because like I said, I've already been testing some of the core components, motherboard and CPU, etc. But I've plugged in our power supply and we're gonna go ahead and give it the old first boot with the conveniently located power button right here on the side. Oh, hey, it springs to life. Our lights are now working. We've got two LCD panels, both the add-on one down here and the one on the Tough Liquid Ultra 360 are lit up. And by default, it is reporting the liquid temperature, which is staying nice and chilly since we're not really doing anything with the system. And there is a lot more that we could do with the system in terms of setup for the LCD panels, RGB lighting configurations, and messing around with Thermaltake software. But because there's already so much going on in this video with the 7800X 3D, the giveaway, the charity fundraiser, and of course, this awesome build, we are out of time for right now. So that is gonna wrap it up. I will post links to all the hardware that I've used in this build down in the video's description, as well as a link to the 7800X 3D, as well as links to the giveaway and the GoFundMe for Travis. I wanna say a big thank you to all of you guys for watching this video. I wanna say a big thank you to Thermaltake for sponsoring the video and the giveaway. And if you guys have any feedback for me on this build, on the performance of the 7800X 3D, or anything else, leave those in the comments section down below. You could also help me out by hitting the thumbs up button on this video if you enjoyed it. And if you'd like a more step-by-step -step walkthrough on building a PC like this, check out my How to Build a PC in 2023 tutorial, which is a new series which I'm only midway through publishing. Thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you all in the next video.